And let's uh, welcome Mark, the one and only Mark Gorman. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dave. Praise the Lord. All right, so there we go, Ashley. You got it? Thank you. Did I say it right, Ashley? Is that right? Is this Ashley? Okay, I got it. Okay. I'm, all these names I'm learning, I'm like, who's who? And you are Cheryl? Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I needed that one. Thank you, bro. All right, let's see if we can turn this. On. There we go. I knew I was here. I saw me come in. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh. Back at GT. Man, I love this place. You know, uh, my mic's on this side. I always go for adjusting it on the wrong side here. But um, first of all, I want to say how thrilled I am to have my gorgeous wife, Gina, with me. Stand up, let everybody see how beautiful you are, how blessed I am. I love you, sweetheart. We have two children, Kenneth and Shara. Our son, Kenneth, is now a doctor. He graduated medical school last year, and uh, he told us the other day, he said, he said when, I, when I'm uh, working with patients, he said, I'll, I'll go into the room with them, and I'll say, uh, if they're going through something difficult, I'll say, are you a person of faith? You know, you have to watch the words these days. Are you a person of faith? And he said, then I'll say, would you like for me to pray with you? And she said, I'm able to pray with my patients all through the day every day. Isn't that awesome to be able to do that? So, um, and then uh, Shara and her husband, Michael. Her husband, Michael, uh, owns an electrical business in Long Island, New York. And... Um, and their, their, their main client is Verizon. Job security, okay? They, they, they handle all Verizon business, uh, all their repairs for all of Long Island, which is over 100 miles long. Thus the word long, okay? But anyway, so thank you, Dave. And <laughs> maybe not, they're not for everyone. Thank you, Roger. Okay, appreciate it. Appreciate y'all being here. Uh, but... And, and, uh, and then they handled Verizon for all five boroughs in New York City. I mean, God's really blessed them. And so, and so um, but in the last couple of years, they just, uh, they, they were just thinking red. And so they moved to Florida and um, from New York to Florida, and they love it there. So they're, they're living in Florida, and God's blessing them. And our grandson, MJ, is eight years old. We're so happy for that. Now... Also, I brought one other person with me tonight, Boudreau. And uh, I've had people asking me if I brought Boudreau with me. Um, some of you who don't know me have no clue what that means. Um, we, we are from New Orleans, and I'd appreciate you don't call it New Orleans, please. But anyway, it's New Orleans, and whoever wrote Nolens, N apostrophe A W L I N S, there is not one person who lives there that calls it Nolens. But anyway, it's New Orleans, but whatever. But we're from there. Gina was born there, and, um, and down in South Louisiana, we have some people called Cajuns. Any of y'all ever heard of Cajuns? Yeah. And uh, Cajuns are French people, they're originally from Canada. Uh, used to be called, the place they're from is now Nova Scotia, but it used to be called Acadia. And uh, they were forced out by the British years ago during the, uh, the French Indian War. And so when they came, they heard there were French people in South Louisiana, New Orleans. So they were like, let's go all the way from Canada, all the way down to see these French people down there in New Orleans. So they got down there 
And the French people in New Orleans from France were like snobs. This is a long time ago, back when they used to be that way. So anyway, so, so, long time ago. So, so anyway, the, 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 the people from Acadia in, in Canada, the, 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 the French people from, from Europe, they said, we don't want to call them French, they're Acadians. So they called them Acadians. And so eventually, Acadians was just too many syllables. So they shortened it to Cajuns. So it went from Acadians to Cajuns. Now we had our history lesson class. That's who they are. So, so Gina, Gina is half Cajun French. Her whole left side is, is Cajun. And, um, and, and so, so down in South Louisiana, we, we tell stories about Boudreau and Thibodeau, French guys, Boudreau and Thibodeau. And uh, I, I really started doing this when I started speaking in business conventions and um, God opened the door. I wasn't looking to speak in business conventions, but God opened this door for me to speak in a lot of business conventions and, uh, and I've spoken in a lot, I mean, all over the world. And, uh, but when I started doing it, they would introduce me as a preacher. And the minute that these people in these, you know, they paid a lot of money to come in here and learn how to get rich, you know? And they hear that a preacher's on stage. They thought, oh, he's going he's gonna to preach against money and all this, so I got to get out of here. And, and so, like, at least half the audience would suddenly go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I figured at least I'm a good diuretic, you know. So, um, so, so I realized I'm going to have to get something that's going to hook them, get them to stay in here. So I started telling Boudreau and Thibodeau stories before I would speak. And I would tell the people, don't introduce me as a preacher. They said, but they need to know you're a preacher. I said, I'll tell them when they can handle it. They said, what do you mean when they can handle it? I said, when you go to the dentist, they numb you up first. Okay, let me numb them up a little bit. So I'd tell a couple of Boudreau and Thibodeau stories. And then when everybody's laughing, I'd be like, I'm a preacher. And go right on into my presentation and, and it just flowed just like, you know. And, and through the years, God blessed in those business conventions, we, we've had over 170,000 people come to Jesus Christ at those business conventions. Not, not all of them, but some of them, uh, over half of them would allow me to do an optional church service after their event, and I could promote it, get people to come, and, and we just used it to win people to Jesus, and we thank God for that. Anyway, so, so uh, you know, when I first started telling them, I just tell them the jokes as a goof, you know, just to get people to, you know, stick around and listen to me. And eventually, the, my, my assistant came to me. He said, everybody who comes to the table out in the lobby is asking, where's the Boudreaux and Thibodeau stuff? And we're like, these are his teachings on how to, how to create success using scripture and biblical principles. They're like, eh, I don't want to create success. I don't want, I want Boudreaux and Thibodeau. So, um, he said, you're gonna to have to record an album. So now we have three live albums that I did of Boudreaux. Dave, sometimes, Dave, a while back, Dave called me and he said, I just need, I need a Boudreaux story, Mark. Just tell me, I, I'm having a rough day. Just tell me Boudreaux. But um, it was a few years ago you did that. Mark, I just need some Boudreaux stuff. Um, but anyway, so Boudreaux has been supporting our ministry for several years now uh, with those uh, CDs. But... Um, let me, tell you, let me tell you a little bit about Boudreaux, okay? Uh, the, the, the Cajuns, they talk like this, okay? So, so Boudreaux's wife is named Clotilde, okay? And, uh, and, and one time, Clotilde wanted to go downtown New Orleans to do some shopping. They live down on Baye La Fouche, okay, down in Galliano, which is about an hour from New Orleans, so, so they, uh, Clotilde wanted to go, to, to go do some shopping on Canal Street, which is the main shopping street in New Orleans. So she went down there. She parked in one of them parking garages. And so she's walking down the sidewalk towards the store. And all of a sudden, right there, she sees a pet store. And so in front of the pet store, there's this big cage, and they got a parrot in the cage. And she notices the parrot's looking straight at her. So she looks at the parrot. She keeps getting closer, and the parrot's staring at her. She gets up close. She said, hey, lady, you are ugly. She said, well. She went on past, did her shopping. 
After about three or two hours, she finished her shopping. She's going back to her car. She completely forgotten. She gets close. She's, oh, here's that parrot again. She sees him, and he's still looking at her, just staring right at her. He gets up close. He said, lady, you are really ugly. She said, well, that did it. She went into the pet store. She said, I want to talk to the manager right now. Toot sweet. Get him out here. So they got the, the manager out there. She said, look, my name, Clotilde Boudreau. I'm from Galliano down on Baia La Fouche. I came here to do some shopping today. I have been past your store twice times today, and twice times that parrot out there has insulted me. If that parrot insults me one more time calling me ugly, I'm going to sue you for everything you're worth, and I will end up owning this store, and the first thing I will do as the new owner is I will far you. By the way, for Cajuns, far is not a distance. Okay, it's about terminating their employment. Okay, so she said, I will far you. He said, Madam, I promise you that parrot will never call you ugly again. She went back home. After about four or three months, she decided she needed to do some more shopping downtown New Orleans, parked at the same place. You know, you get in the habit parking the same parking garage. She parked there, completely forgot about the parrot. She starts walking down the sidewalk, all of a sudden, oh, cho. There's that parrot again. So she gets up close. Hey, that, the parrot just staring at her. She's staring at him. She gets closer and closer. She gets up close enough. The parrot says, hey, lady. She looked at him. He said, you know. <laughs> uh, huh. One time, the, the, the mafia uh, was having problem in Lafayette. The mafia was having problems with their bag man. Y'all know what a bag man is? Okay, it's a guy who goes around and collects all the money everybody owes him. So they had trouble with their bag man. He, he, he was stealing all their money. So they got rid of him. And, so they need, and when I say they got rid of him, that doesn't mean he's working somewhere else now. <laughs> They really terminated his employment, okay? <laughs> so, so they got him a new bag man, and the new bag man was deaf and dumb. He couldn't hear, he couldn't talk. They figured that way he couldn't tell nobody about their money, like he couldn't write a note. But anyway, so they, they had this new bag man, and the first week, he collected over $50,000. He had never seen that much money in his life, my friend. So in order to be real subtle, he stole all of it. <laughs> so now the mafia needed to know what happened with their money, and they needed somebody who could speak sign language to talk to him. So they found out that Boudreaux's best friend, Thibodeau, had taken some sign language classes. So they hired Tip. They said, Thibodeau, we need you to come down here with us and talk to this bag man for us. We need to find out about this missing money. So it's, it's two of these, what they call button men. You know, they push buttons, you know, for the mafia. So anyway, they had two of them, and, and the bag man, they, they, that's deaf and dumb, and they had Thibodeau standing there to translate. And so he said, tell him we want to know where the money is. So Thibodeau said, they want to know what, by the way, this is not real sign language I'm doing. I don't want to confuse anybody. This is a joke, okay? So this is not, don't, don't get confused. This is not real, okay? So anyway, so, so he said, they want to know where the money is. So, so the guy looks at Thibodeau. He said, I don't know what money you're talking about. Thibodeau looked at the mafia guy. He said, he, he, he was nervous. He said, he, he, he. He, he said, he, he don't know where the money is. He said, tell him, if he don't tell us where the money is, we're going to beat him up. Thibodeau said, if you don't tell him where the money is, they're going to beat you up. That was real sign language right there. That, 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 that was sign language. He said, they're going to beat you up. The guy said, I don't know what money you're talking about. Thibodeau said, he, he. He don't know what money you're talking about. 
the guy pulls a Glock 45 caliber out of his out of his waistband. He puts it up to the guy's head. He said, tell him, if he don't tell me where the money is, I'm going to blow his brains out. People don't say, if you don't tell him where the money is, they're going to blow your brains out. That bag man starts sweating. His eyes get real big. He starts shaking all over. He said, tell them that the money is hid in a hollow tree on the northeast part of the lake in in City Park in downtown Lafayette, Louisiana. See what I'm saying? He said he don't know what money you're talking about, and he don't think you got the guts to pull that trigger. <laughs> hmm. Oh, well. All right. One more quick one. <laughs> one time, Budro showed up at work. Thibodeau said, hey, Bud, what's that you got under your arm? He said, that's a thermos. He said, a thermos? What's a thermos? He said, I got it down at the Walmart. The guy said it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. He said, how does it know? He said, I don't know, but it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. He said, this is my first day using it. He said, what you got in there? He said, coffee and a popsicle. <laughs> mm. Mm. I'm preacher. Okay, so. Uh, I, I literally cannot put into words how absolutely much I love Dave and Cheryl. I just, I can't even tell you. You know, I've told Gina and I've told other people that there are times that, that I look at Dave and it's like I'm looking into the eyes of Jesus. I just see the love of Jesus pouring through him and it just overwhelms me. And I'm not saying that to kiss up. I'm saying that genuinely. I just, you know, when you tell people that this is a church that does deliverance, he's an exorcist, you don't expect love of Jesus pouring out of their eyes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and and we, we were driving home from lunch today and uh, we had such a great lunch and great time catching up with them. And, and Cheryl, she's so humble. She doesn't even know how great she is and what, how much God's just so powerfully, uh, you know, so much. But she's, She's like oblivious to it. She's just Cheryl, you know, just no, no pretense, you know. And, uh, and I told Gina, we're driving home. I said, Gina, Cheryl is among us, but she's not of us. Okay, she, she just, I said, I said, she exists in a different plane than the rest of us do. And sometimes she dips down into the dirt world to commune with us and then returns to her plane. So uh, if, you, if you don't know Cheryl, you don't know what I'm talking about, but some of you do. I mean, you know. And uh, goodness, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll try and be brief with this part because I want to get into the teaching, but I, 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 I wasn't going to tell this. I feel like I'm supposed to. Because I told it to you last night, just us brothers. I, I have in my life, I have two spiritual fathers and eight spiritual brothers that I hold myself accountable to. People I am transparent with and no secrets and just total accountability. And, and Dave is one of those eight brothers to me. He is one of the eight to me. 
And the way that I met them, I, in, 19, in the mid-1980s, like the late 1980s, my heroes started falling. Does anybody remember the late 80s, the preachers that were just the scandals and the, all that stuff? And I was trying to understand what is going on. How can somebody so anointed of God have something so dirty in their life? How is it possible to have both? And and I wasn't just trying to understand it about them. I knew I wasn't perfect. I knew things about me. And I was like, I how could I be used of God when I'm in the pulpit and then struggle with things when I'm just living my life? And I'd been brought up in a denomination, same one Dave was brought up in. We're free of charge, they told us. Christians cannot have demons. They won't get anywhere near you. In fact, we even believed that you had to be backslid for at least six months before a demon came around. So, you know, we just believed demons were nowhere near a Christian. And, you know, I tell people when I, when, I, when I teach on spiritual warfare, I'm like, I'm like, so if you went to buy a house and the people are showing you the house and they're like, but we've never had termites. You won't even have to have a termite inspection. The, the house has never had termites, but you love the house. We hope you'll like it, but you don't even need a termite inspection because we've never had any problems with termites. What's the first thing you're going to do? Get a termite inspection, unless you're in the denomination we grew up in, in which case you would say, well, they said you can't have termites in here, so let's not even look. (laughs) Right? So I was struggling with all this. I'd been brought up that way. Christians can't have any demonic activity, but I was seeing all this stuff, and I'm like, What's going on? So I started digging deeper and deeper to understand what was going on. And I got so deep into it. And I started seeing strongholds, that strongholds are not about the world, they're about us. Because a stronghold is a portion of territory that refuses to submit to the authority that's over the rest of the territory. So how can a sinner have a stronghold? They can't, because none of them is submitted. So only a Christian can have a stronghold, because most of you are submitted, but you got that little pocket of rebellion that won't give in. That's the stronghold. So I started teaching this, 1989, okay? And I was traveling to different churches. I didn't pastor my own church, so I didn't have the liberty to just go in there and do deliverance on people. So I'm I'm under authority when I go to preach these churches, but I'm teaching on this. And I, I taught it at at my dad's church in New Orleans in 1989. And after the service, he said, don't you ever preach that again about Christians having demonic activity in their lives. Not in this church, unless God tells me different. Now he did that not out of meanness. He did that because he felt accountable to God for the souls and the, the, the lives of the people he was pastoring and he had been brought up to believe that, okay? He didn't know, but that didn't make it hurt less. When your dad tells you that, Oh, I was beat down, man. But I knew I had to keep teaching it. So we still kept traveling. And I kept preaching about strongholds and, and, and about the three heavens, all the stuff I teach on spiritual warfare. And I was teaching all these years. And finally, in 1998, I was preaching in, in Texas. And Cheryl was there do, give, giving a women's conference at her uncle and aunt's uh, church for their women's group. And she heard me on Sunday morning. I was teaching on spiritual warfare, just spiritual warfare light. (laughs) Like, if you're familiar with with fancy food, it was like an amuse-bouche. It wasn't even an appetizer. It was just an amuse-bouche of spiritual warfare. But anyway, she read between the lines. She came to the table afterwards. She said, you and my husband teach the same thing. I'm like, Somebody else 
this is awesome, I gotta meet this guy. So I said, take these tapes on strongholds, let your husband listen to them. A month later, he calls me and gets me to come out here to, to, to speak at what's now you call it the well. I was, I was over there preaching. And then after the service, Dave starts telling me what had been going on here for the last year. I was like, so I'm right? So I'm right? This guy is proof. These guys prove what I've been trying to tell everybody. And so then I was listening to one of his Isaiah 61 conferences. He's talking about uh, Jack uh, Sisler. Sisler, is that right? Giving him that book. And he said, I didn't read it for like eight years. And I'm like, 1987, count back. That's 1989. That's first time, that's when my dad told me I couldn't teach on that in the church anymore. That's when I was teaching. I'd been teaching it all those years and didn't know that Dave and Sheriff, well, of course, they, they, had, they, they didn't have it until 1997. So I like, I went home. I was just so fired up. They gave me the hope that really God could help people be free through these teachings. And a few years later, my dad told me, he said, son, you're the best teacher on spiritual warfare I've ever heard. I was like, what? And he said, especially your teachings on strongholds. I was like, who are you? But Dave and Cheryl helped me get through that. They helped me to hang on all those years because they, this church is proof that people can get free, stay free, and help others get free. Now, um, the Lord is, is changing things in our ministry, taking me back into traveling ministry. And, and we're, we have a church in New Orleans, but God has just, just changed. We've, we've re restructured the way the church works so that I can travel at will and, and go out. And we're, I'm preaching everywhere again. And God's, but God told me, he said, when you go back out, you're gonna focus on Holy Spirit. You're gonna teach people about the power of Holy Spirit and how to be filled with Holy Spirit. And, and see, when, um, well, just, let me just say, tonight and tomorrow morning, to, tonight I'm gonna talk to you about the power of Holy Spirit. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna talk to you about the how-to of Holy Spirit, of tongues, of intercession, of understanding how Holy Spirit works in our lives. So it's a, it's a two-parter. If you only get in for one, maybe you can catch the other one on, on YouTube, but I hope you'll come back tomorrow and hear that one because it's gonna be two different messages, both targeting Holy Spirit. And real quickly, before, before I start teaching, let me just say to you, um, we didn't bring a lot of stuff with us to, 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 to uh, sell on the table. We have tons and tons of stuff. If you want to go to my website, it's, it's myname.com. Don't type in M-Y-N-A-M-E dot, okay. Anyway, it's markgorman.com. So um, but anyway, um, this book I did not write. My mother wrote this book, just came out a couple of years ago. It's Now is the Time to Teach Your Children. When I, was, when I was a boy, my mother, every day when we got home from school, we knew that before we did our homework, before we went outside to play, every afternoon we went straight to my parents' bedroom, my mother would sit there with us and teach us the Bible every afternoon before we went outside to play, okay? Before we could walk out the door to play, we had to quote a scripture verse to her, okay? So... When I was two years old, two years old, they put me on a chair behind the pulpit at our church and I quoted three scriptures at age two to the congregation. You said, well, you must be gifted. No, every child is memorizing stuff at that age. 
They're all memorizing stuff. It's, it's whether you're propping it in front of a TV and they're memorizing that or whether you're teaching them the word of God. So my mother and dad, uh, they, they were just struggling financially, you know, in ministry. They weren't, they weren't paid much. And, and, and they went to a, a ministry conference and my mother went through the little bookshop they had there. And she said, I want to get a book that I can read to the kids. And like once a week, I'll read one chapter of the book and that'll give us something special for devotions, you know, once a week. And so she bought this book called Mystery of the Black Book. And it was so intriguing. I mean, we just sat there spellbound as she was reading it to us. And she got to the end of chapter one and we said, keep reading, keep reading. So she started reading chapter two. We said, keep reading. And by now, all the kids in the neighborhood that wanted to play with us, they came around to my parents' bedroom window. They knew that's where we went for devotions every afternoon. They're banging on the window. Let them come outside and play. And my brother went over and pulled the curtain shut so that they wouldn't look in. And we sat back down, and my mother read that entire book to us that afternoon. And at the end of it, my sister, who was, I think, four years old, with tears running down her face, said, Mother, how can I ask Jesus into my heart? And, and my mother, when she was writing this book, she said, I want to find out if I can make that book, Mystery of the Black Book, available to people. She contacted the publishing company. They said it's no longer in print. They gave her the name of the family. The, the lady who wrote it has passed away. They gave her the name of the family. My mother called them. They said, you have full liberty to, to, to sell it, to write it, to do whatever you want with it. Just take it. My mother does not know about copy and paste on the computer. She <laughs> typed the entire book word by word into this manuscript of Mystery of the Black. So the second half of this book is Mystery of the Black Book. The first part is about how to teach your children the Word of God. But if you love your kids, your grandkids, you need this book, okay? It'll it'll really help you. Also, we have the books uh, that I wrote on spiritual warfare, The Three Heavens, where I teach on strongholds, uh, all of that er erroneous stuff that I was teaching in those churches back then. (laughs) Anyway, this is the stuff that I started teaching in in 1989 and and then came here in 1998 and found it was right. All right, so anyway, so, um, and then this book is on God's plan for prosperity. In here I teach the four types of giving and uh, I'm sorry we already sold out of all the ones on how to go broke. Uh, Those sell really fast. So... So uh, this is all we have left is the one on prosperity. And the last thing I'll mention real quickly is that since we didn't bring any of my uh, CDs or DVDs and all that, we, on our website, you can go there and order anything off of there. And, uh, but also we have a flash drive that has, I'm gonna say it has about two thirds, a little over half of, of, of everything I, I have on the website on this flash drive. It's four gigabytes of information. And uh, if you bought it uh, separately on the website, all of this would cost you about close to $1,400. But if you get it on the flash drive, you can get it for $1,350. So it's a real... (laughs) No. On our website, we sell it for $299. But here... It's $99. So if you want to get that, Gina has them there at the back, $99. And, uh, but you know, $99 is a big purchase. So you might not want to rush into it. Maybe just wait till after we leave and then go to the website and order it off of there. So um, the $299 price. Anyway, all right, go ahead. So some of them didn't catch that. All right, so let's... All right, here we go. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Oh, can you hand me a bottle of water, please? Thank you. Fiji. Thank you. Dave, Dave promoted that. You told us that you have a friend had something to put in the... Is that, was that... It's you that did that? Man, I didn't know that. I know him. All right, praise the Lord, I'll shut up. 
All right. Now, Acts chapter 8. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tonight's message is brought to you by Fiji. <laughs> Acts chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were incorrectly translated, possessed. We know they weren't possessed, but anyway, that's the way they translated it. All right. You've heard Dave, right? You know it's not possessed, right? Okay, so anyway. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that. Don't you think there was great joy in the city if, if, if people are getting set free from demons and, and people being healed of, of, of paralyzed limbs? Every, I mean, it's just amazing what God's doing. Turn me up just a hair, guys. I appreciate it. Look here. But there was a certain man called Simon who, was, who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized... He continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had re received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet... He had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to flow among us tonight, O oh God. And we ask you in Jesus' name that you would remove every distraction, every hindrance. We bind every force of hell that would try to prevent any person from receiving what God has purposed for us to receive tonight. We declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord over every person in this place. He is Lord over this word, and this word will accomplish what he's sending it to accomplish. In his name, amen. You know, when, um, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was five years old. Five years old got saved at a boys and girls camp, and then they prayed for me to receive the Holy Spirit. And back then, we, we were taught that you needed to tarry for the Holy Spirit. Has anybody been around long enough to remember when we used to say tarry for the Holy Spirit? Anybody remember that? Oh, goodness. If you wanted to receive the Holy Spirit, now we gotta get you comfortable. It's gonna be a while. I mean, here I am, little five-year-old Mark, laying on the sawdust in the, in the big uh, tabernacle thing they had there at the camp. And I had one lady that was sitting down there, my head was on her lap, another lady holding up this hand, another lady holding up this hand, another one fanning me, and they're praying with me. And by the time I got filled with the Holy Spirit, started speaking in tongues, the lights were out, everybody had gone to their cabins, you know. As your faith is, so be it unto you. We were taught you had to wait. And 
There was a time when they did have to wait. If you recall in Acts chapter one, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he said for them to wait for the promise of the Father, okay? He told them to wait for Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the church, most people in the church, thought that meant that you ought, that he is like chronically late. He just can't get anywhere on time. And so we all just accepted it. You want to receive Holy Spirit? Ah, we don't have time right now. Can we do that another night? It's going to take a while. That's the way my my dad received. That's the way my mother received. That's the way my brother and my sister, we all received Holy Spirit that way. That's the way everybody received Holy Spirit back then. But then, when I was 17 years old, in 1974, God spoke to my dad and he said, I want you to go back in the book of Acts and see if they waited after the day of Pentecost. And my dad started seeing, like in this passage we just read, it said that that when Peter and John got there, it said 17, verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they waited and waited and waited and what? No, it doesn't. They laid hands on them and boom, they received Holy Spirit. See, the only reason that they had to wait the first time was because God is a brilliant strategist at marketing and advertising. That is the reason, okay? I've been doing a a teaching at at our home church going through the book of Acts. And when I got to that part, I was like, oh, I see what God was doing here. Okay, I get it. Because what happened was, it says that on the day of Pentecost, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven that were in Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. Now, when Jesus died, he was crucified on what day? Passover. The word Pentecost is a Greek word. It means 50. That's what it means, 50. So count 50 days after Passover, there's Pentecost. So when Jesus died on the cross, on the third day, he was raised. Then the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, he stayed for 40 more days so they could see that he had definitely risen from the dead. And he performed many miracles. So that's 43 days. And we're looking for what? 50. So that's why they had to wait. Not for Holy Spirit, but for all of the devout Jews from every nation under heaven to get there so they could all get saved, baptized in water, and filled with Holy Spirit and take it back to every nation under heaven. So... In 1974, I was 17 years old. I remember we had just, we had just bought, our church had just bought this, this building that was just so ginormous, we couldn't even believe it. It was just gigantic building of a church that had gone bankrupt and they put it up for auction and God told my dad to buy it and we were outgrowing that church we had, so we bought this huge church. We get in there, the auditorium seated, I'm gonna guess, say 1,200, including the balcony, probably maybe 1,500 if you squeeze them in. We'd just been in there for like maybe two or three months and we couldn't even fill the ground floor yet. And my dad gets up and announces to everyone, God told me for us to have a tent revival on the big parking lot out there across the street from the church. And I'm like, oh my goodness, he's nuts. This is insane. We can't even fill this and you're gonna put up a tent? What are you thinking? Well, in that tent, we didn't realize at the time, but see, a lot of the Catholic, New Orleans is primarily Catholic in the church world, predominantly Catholic because of the French and Spanish influence there when they, when they founded New Orleans. And so therefore, the, a lot of the Catholic people had been taught, do not enter another church. 
but they didn't say anything about tents. And so a lot of Catholic people came to that tent crusade and got filled with the Holy Spirit. And I mean, when we moved back into the building two weeks later, we were up into the balcony. But God told my dad, he said, I want you every week for the two weeks, I want you to have one special night each week that you're going to preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit and get people filled with the Holy Spirit and you're going to announce it on TV and radio. And God said, but after this study I just took you through where I showed you the only time they waited was the day of Pentecost. Other than that, they never waited. I want you to believe that people are going to receive like that. The first night that he did it, we had, I think it was like about 50 people filled with the Holy Spirit within like 10 minutes. The, the next week, we had over 75 people filled with the Holy Spirit in just minutes. And so I was 17. I hadn't even preached my first sermon then. So to me, that's how people receive Holy Spirit. It was normal to me that when you go and pray with people receive Holy Spirit, they receive. So... In my ministry, when I would go to churches, and of course, the typical thing then with when I would travel as what we called an evangelist, technically I was more of a teacher than an evangelist, but who cares? Anyway, whatever. So when I would preach in the churches, mainly they would have like a Sunday through Wednesday. So if I did a Sunday through Wednesday, one of those nights would be Holy Spirit night. We'd get people filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just thought that was normal, Okay. And then I started having churches who would say to me, when, when you come back, I want you to preach again on the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, I already did that. They said, well, we've never seen people filled with the Holy Spirit like that. In fact, some of them even talk. One in Australia said, every time you come to Melbourne, you're preaching in my church and you're preaching on the Holy Spirit every time. I've never seen anything like it. I was like, really? You don't have that happen regular? I couldn't believe it. And it wasn't that I had, I was some great, you know, whatever. It's just that I didn't know any different. I thought that was normal. You know? I was, I was preaching at a, at a Korean church in Queens, New York, uh, which is part of New York City. It, this, is, this happens to be the largest Korean church in the world outside of Korea. And they had me come to preach to their youth. And when I preached to the young people, we did Holy Spirit night, one of those nights, and we had 121 filled with the Holy Spirit that night in just minutes. I, I was, a friend of mine wanted me to speak for him at a, at a conference in New Zealand. And, and I get to Auckland, and they, it's, it's a one-week conference. He's brought in speakers from all over the world, and he had all of us there at this, at the, he arranged for this nice dinner for us the, the afternoon before the first service. And he said, okay, guys, those of you who are speaking in the evening services, our main keynote speakers, here's what I want. You're gonna do Monday night, you're gonna do Tuesday night. Mark, you're doing Wednesday night, you're preaching on the Holy Spirit. You're gonna do Thursday night, and I'll do Friday night. And I'm like, wait a minute, I noticed something. I'm the only one you assigned a topic to. And I already had a really cool youth sermon that I was ready to do. That was really cool. He said, you're preaching on Holy Spirit. I said, why? They're not gonna wanna hear about Holy Spirit. He said, yes, they are. And they need Holy Spirit. I said, well, I know they do. But I said, why are you doing it? He said, because I've never seen people receive the Holy Spirit like when you preach. So you're doing, and so that Wednesday night, I preached on the baptism. We had about 2,000 young people there. I preached on the Holy Spirit. And after the service, they came to me. The leaders at the conference came to me. Their count, not my count. They said over 300 teenagers were speaking in tongues in the first five minutes after you prayed with them. This is, none of this is bragging on me. I'm telling you, I didn't know any different. This is all I knew. This is all God, okay? I'm saying this to build your faith to know that tonight when we have the altar service, 
You're gonna speak in tongues. You're gonna get filled. It's gonna happen. God has put a special dose of the ghost on me to pray for you. It's not me, it's him. And when we pray, boom. I was at a church a few weeks ago and I asked the pastor, I said, when I get through praying, praying with them, I said, let's watch them. And anyone who's having difficulty, uh, you know, speaking in tongues, maybe you can step in and start praying with them. And afterwards he gets up and grabs the microphone. He said, he wanted me to pray for anybody who had difficulty speaking in tongues. He said, there wasn't any time. He said, as soon as he finished praying, they're all speaking in tongues or any time. I, I was preaching at a church in Sarasota, Florida years ago. This is funny. And this guy came out of a oneness church background. You know what I mean by oneness? Okay, we are threeness, they are oneness. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> and they don't believe you're saved until you speak in tongues. Y'all know that, right? Okay, so I figured this guy must be awesome at getting people filled with the Holy Spirit, but I'm still gonna do a Holy Spirit night. And it, it, he had left the oneness church, but he, you know, he still had that background and he was non-denominational. And so uh, after the service, we had, I, I, he didn't have a huge church. I think he had about 150 people there and we had like about 40 or 45 people through the Holy Spirit. I think maybe two people had difficulty, but other than that, everybody, you know, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're, he's driving me to go eat after the service. He said, so uh, was that like average to you? I said, average, what do you mean average? He said, what happened in the altars tonight? Did people speaking in tongues so fast? What, was that just like normal to you? I said, well, that's what happens. So that, that just happens every time you, uh, well, yeah. It's what's supposed to happen. I didn't know, I didn't know what he was, I didn't, at the time, duh, I wasn't getting it. He was like sort of preacher jealous, you know? It was like, so that just happens for you, just every time, you know? So, I want you to believe that God's gonna do something great, but first I wanna talk about this guy, Simon the Sorcerer, okay? Because this dude was willing to pay money to get the ability to lay his hands on people, and it was not for the miracles that Philip had. See, a lot of the people who are what we call cessationist, they believe that after the book of Acts, all the gifts, everything stopped working, and uh, apparently God liked them better and gave them all of that, but we don't get it. But he did dedicate a lot of chapters talking about what we don't have. So we can study what they had and wonder what it was like. I don't believe that way, but that's the way they believe. And so they will tell you that after the day of Pentecost, people didn't speak in tongues. Well, what did happen here? It wasn't that you, because a lot of the cessationists, they'll say, when I got saved, I received the Holy Spirit and I just felt it. I felt it. I'm like, is that why he wanted to have that power, pay money so that people can say, ooh, that felt good. I really don't think that's what it was. I believe there was some tangible evidence that happened that you could physically see something happening with these people when they put their hands on them. And whether he was evil or good, what I want to say to you is, he was willing to pay money for that power. And a lot of us have been filled for years and not even taking advantage of it, not using it, not using it. I mean, have you ever seen how that, that when somebody, their heart stops beating, they, they use this thing called a defibrillator and they put it on them and they say clear and then they push the buttons and electricity flows through them and jump starts them back to life. I know a lot about medicine because I watch TV. so. <laughs> I was talking to a registered nurse several years ago and I said, why, why did they say clear before they do that? She said, because there is so much electricity flowing through those paddles 
that if you are touching the sheet, not the person, the cotton sheet they're laying on, there could be enough electricity flow through their body into the sheet that would go into you and stop your heart and kill you. That's how much power it is. She said, that's why when they say clear, everybody does. But they said that after about, I don't know, 15, 20, 25 minutes, whatever, you can, it's not indefinite that you can do that. Just a, a window there that you can, you know, a few minutes that you can jumpstart it back. But imagine a defibrillator that after somebody had been dead for 72 hours, that you could use it and jumpstart them back to life. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? I mean, nobody would want to hold the paddles. No, here, you do it. No, it's your turn. <laughs> that's the kind of power we have access to, and that's a poor uh, description, but I mean, that, that's the kind of power we have access to. See, when, when my dad got saved, my dad was the son of an alcoholic. My, my grandfather never went sober for one week in his life until he got saved on his deathbed. But other than that, he, he got drunk every week. Bad drunk, mean drunk, every week. So when my dad got saved at age 16, he didn't have the benefit that I had of having a father who told me every day of my life, I love you. My dad... He would call me every day. Hey, baby. I was always baby. Hey, baby, I love you. My dad was so affectionate with us because his dad was so mean to him. Sometimes we would be, be visiting there at Christmas. I didn't know this at the time. My dad would told me later. He said there'd be times that he and all of his brothers were sitting in, in the same room. And my grandfather would walk into the room and say, I'm going into town. Joe, George, Terry, y'all want to ride with me? And just leave my dad sitting there. Just mean, mean. At one point, he got so bad with the alcohol that my dad had to go there and take all the knives out of the house so that he wouldn't kill my grandmother. And they had to hide one butcher knife she could cook with that my grandmother, grandfather couldn't find it because that's how mean he would get when he was drunk. So my dad didn't have what I had growing up of, of somebody to mentor me in ministry and teach me things. And dad didn't have that. All he had was his Bible and his knees. That's all he had. He lived on a farm, poor, poor people, lived on a farm in South Arkansas. And when God called him to preach at age 17, he said, I would go out every day. I would take a jug of water and my Bible and I'd go out to the woods and I would just pray and pray. And he said, I didn't know how to preach, but God told me I was supposed to preach. So I'd just preach to the trees and I would get sermons out of that Bible and I would just preach to those trees and just preach to every tree that was out there in the woods. And then God began to bless him because dad read a verse in Hebrews chapter 11 that became his favorite verse in the Bible. Hebrews 11 verse six that says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not that diligently seek a reward, that diligently seek him. And so my dad held on to that verse and he said, God, you're going to reward me if I diligently seek you. When he was 19 years old, he was working at a paper mill. And a guy that worked with him said, hey, Marvin, I heard that, 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 you're, that you, you're a preacher now. He said, yes. He said, I'm going to talk to somebody at my church and see if one, one of them can get it worked out where you can come preach at our church. Dad said, okay. So the guy came back to him. He said, yeah, they said you can come preach for our church. You can come preach a revival. Come preach Sunday through Wednesday. So my dad went there. He was praying, 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 didn't know anything to do. He said the first service, 
He's there just believing God that the power that flowed in the New Testament is still available to us today. And he said, he wasn't trying to be demonstrative about anything. He said, I gave the altar call for people to get saved. And he said, people started coming forward and they all just fell on the floor. When they would get up to come, they just fall on the floor. And he said, everybody's looking at it. He said, I'm leaning over the pulpit. I'm like, what in the world is that? I've never seen that in my life. He said by the, by the fifth night of the revival, his last night, they had opened the windows of the church and people were sitting outside. He said, big old men start coming through the door to get saved at the altar call. They'd all just pile up on each top, top of each other when they're coming through the door. Whoom, 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 piled on each other. And he said, after that revival, about a month later, he got contacted by the leaders of the denomination he was part of that I grew up in. And they said, they had him come in to meet with them and they said, hey, we heard about that revival you had. He said, yeah, that was really something. He said, I, I, I was astounded. I couldn't believe it. They said, well, we want God to use you, but that thing about people falling down, that's not good. You need to stop that. And he started crying. He said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for them to fall down. I want to do the right thing. If you just tell me what I'm supposed to do, I'll do it. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I just want God to use me. And he said, but then he'd go to churches and people kept falling down and he couldn't stop it. So he said, eventually, every time he made an altar call, he'd just have everybody kneel. <laughs> so that way, if they just leaned over, nobody would right notice they fell. <laughs> and then he came to New Orleans and started praying, God, help us reach this city. Help us reach this God-forsaken city, this evil, wicked city. And we came there to a church of 100 people. And that church grew to over 6,000. Because of the move of God that was happening in there, we saw the power of God at work. One time, my dad had a, had a dream. And in the dream, he was sitting on the platform during the service, and everybody was singing. We didn't call it worship back then. It was the song service. But anyway, so, <laughs> so he's sitting there on the platform, and all of a sudden, the, the, the main doors to the sanctuary open up in his dream and he sees a, a, a white man walking in with a black lady. Now I make that distinction because in New Orleans, in the late 60s, early 70s, you didn't see a lot of that. So it stood out to him. Okay. In fact, let me explain the thing about white people, black people to you, okay? My dad's best friend as a boy was a black boy. That's South Arkansas in the 40s. His best friend was a black boy. In fact, when the church started growing, get real big, his secretary got a call one day and said, do you know somebody told, told him his name? He said, my goodness, I haven't seen him in years. He gets on the phone. And he said, hey, preach, because that was my dad's nickname when he, was, when he was a teenager. Everybody called him preach. They called him preacher boy or preach. And so he said, hey, preach. He said, can you believe I'm pastoring a church here in Arkansas? My dad said, you are. I didn't know you went in the ministry. He said, yeah. He said, I was wondering. I know you got that big church there in New Orleans, but would you come back here and preach at our church? He said, sure, for you, man. I'll come back there. So my parents went back to Arkansas to preach at that church. This would have been in the late 70s or early 80s. And my parents went in there, and it was a little, you know, beautiful little white wooden church right out in the woods, like you see, you know, just, just cute picture postcard church. And they went inside, and my parents said they were the only white people in there, just black people everywhere in the building. And when it came time for my dad to be introduced to preach, his best friend from his boyhood called him up the front. He said, preach, come up here. And he put his arm around my dad. He said, these are all your spiritual children. And my dad said, what? He said, what do you mean? I, I, I don't know any of these people. I've never seen any. I remember faces. I, I've never seen any of them. He said, what you didn't know was, he said, we all grew up as sharecroppers 
living in little huts out on the side of the woods, on the other side of the woods from where you pray, prayed every afternoon. And he said, when you'd be preaching to those trees, we were listening. And these people got saved listening to you preach to those trees. He said, we would hurry up and get our work done every day so we could be home in time to have our, our dinner on the back porch and listen to preacher preach, out, preach to the trees out there. He said, in every one of these people, either they were saved or their, or their parents were saved listening to you preach to the trees. And I, I apologize if I'm going too long. I, I, I told Dave it's going to take me a little while to tell the story tonight before we pray with people. So please forgive me if I'm going too long. But, but I, I really want y'all to hear these stories, okay? Um, but dad had that dream. And then a few weeks later, he's sitting in church on a Sunday night. And the door's open. And there comes the black lady with the white man. And she had a cane. She was blind. He had seen that in the dream, that she was blind. And in his dream, let me just go ahead and tell you the whole dream. In the dream, she was blind, and halfway through his sermon, God told him, in the dream, God told him, it's time to pray for the lady to be healed. So dad had called her out, called her to the front, had her stand about, I'm gonna say about right, I was in the service when it happened, so she was standing about right here, maybe by, by the third row, and dad's praying for her, and in the dream, he saw that the first time he prayed for her and he said, can you see anything? She said, nope. He said, let's pray again. He prayed again. He said, can you see anything? She said, nope. He said, let's pray again. So he prayed the third time and suddenly she reached out and said, that's a beautiful blue tie you're wearing. And she touched the tip of his nose and said, you have beautiful brown eyes. Now, this is all his dream. So a few weeks later, he's sitting on a platform, sees them walk in. He's like, huh? He hadn't told any of us the dream. He didn't know it was going to really happen. He didn't know. He didn't tell any of us the dream. I was about 15 years old. I was sitting about five, six rows back on this side. He gets to a certain point in his sermon. He's like, I got to quit preaching. God told me it's time to pray for the lady. Would you bring her forward? Dad comes down the same place he saw in his dream. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, Dad, this is a stupid move. I, I, I have lived 15 years on this earth. And I have enough wisdom to know that when you like single somebody out, that you're going to pray for that specific person. If they don't get healed, it's going to look really bad. It's going to be like a downer. Everybody's going to go home. They're going to say, how was the service? Ah, wasn't that good. I was like, it would have been so much smarter if you just had everybody line up across the front, let her blend into the crowd. And then if she doesn't see, then you're like, well, we're believing that God will continue to move in your life as you go home. And we're praying that you will come back and tell us that God has completed the healing in your life. Good night. God bless you. So that's what I was thinking that he should have done. But instead, he calls her out, has her stand there with nobody around her, just him and her. Prayed for her the first time. She said, can you see? She said, no. I'm like, see? It's exactly what I was talking about. You shouldn't have done this. You're making yourself a mockery, Dad. He said, let's pray again. I'm like, oh, no. Now it's going to get worse. People are going to say, you're digging a dry hole. You didn't strike water. You didn't strike oil. This is terrible. So he prays for her the second time. Can you see? No. Let's pray again. What are you doing? He said as he was praying for her the third time, he suddenly thought, Oh my goodness, what color is the tie I'm wearing? <laughs> he said, so 
as I was praying, I sort of opened my eyes a little bit and peeked down, and sure enough, I was wearing a blue tie, and I was like, Phew, thank God I'm wearing the blue tie. <laughs> and after he finished praying for us, she reached out and said, that's a beautiful blue tie. Touched his nose, said, you have beautiful brown eyes. She was healed. See, we need to believe for that kind of power. Yeah. Do I have time for one more story before we pray? Is that all right? All right. I saw some people leaving. I didn't know if it was my breath or what. But anyway, so I just want to tell you one more story real quickly, and then, and then, then we'll get uh, done with this. But just pretend we're in an Isaiah 61 conference. Then this won't seem so long, okay? So it'll be good. Right, Dave? I love that. I told some people in our church about the Isaiah 61 videos, and they said, we watched 10 hours in a row. We couldn't stop watching that guy. So, um, so, so anyway, um, at our, when we got into that bigger church and it really started growing, my dad was so sensitive to the spirit. I remember I, I used to come into the service and I'd be sitting way over here, the, all of our family sat on that front row on that side. And, Dad would come in there and everybody else is singing, got their hands lifted, worship and praising the Lord. And my dad comes in there and he's doing this. And I thought, how rude. How absolutely rude. We're all singing and praising the Lord and your nose has to be in everybody else's business to see what's going on. I didn't realize God was telling him stuff about people that he'd call them out of the audience and tell them what was going on in their life. And that's what he was doing. But he would sometimes have as many as three salvation altar calls in one service. One of my spiritual fathers was on staff then, and he was in charge of the altar workers team. He had to keep records of all the people who filled out forms after they were prayed with at the front. And they had a place on there where they could check if they were first time salvation or rededication. And he said, in one year, we had over 16,000 first time salvations. And we just filled all the churches in New Orleans with new, new, we just sent them to all the church. Dad didn't try to keep them. He just said, go, go to whatever, here's some churches to go to. We started eight churches out of our church. We started eight churches in the region. And so, so dad was, had, had this altar call in the middle of service. He hadn't even preached yet. He had a salvation altar call. And it was, no, it wasn't just salvation. It was to pray for whatever needs anybody had. So he gets to the middle of the line here. And there's, of course, a lot of Catholics in New Orleans. There was a little lady with a rosary. Y'all know what a rosary is? So she's, she's praying. He said she was working those beads. That's why my dad said it. She's working those beads, man. She was praying that rosary, you know, really going to town. And, and he came up to her and he said, darling, he said, he said we, don't, we don't use the rosary here. He said, why don't we just lay it down and let, let me pray for you and you can lift your hand. She said, Father Gorman, you don't understand. She said, we've got to touch God. And she said, I'm desperate for God to do a miracle. And she said, so here's what's going to happen. You pray your way, I'll pray my way, but let's touch God. He said, okay, keep the rosary. So he prayed with her. She was slain in the spirit. Most people, when they get slain in the spirit, like a minute or so, they're back up, go to their seat. She was one of those that it was a nap, okay? She was out for a while, okay? So they put the little modesty cloth, oh, you know, we did the modesty cloth, they had the modesty cloth over, so she's laying there. And my dad, when he preached, he would just walk around the building and he'd just walk preaching all over the place. So he's walking around her as he's preaching, she's just out. So he's preaching the message and he's over on this row with his cordless microphone, he's over here preaching, right close to where I was sitting. And all of a sudden, a drunk guy she comes in through the doors and walks all the way. Now, our ushers had been trained how to deal with situations like this. And dad's thinking, where are the ushers? And this drunk guy walks all the way up to him, almost nose to nose. 
And my dad had to stop preaching for a moment because the guy was standing right there. And dad said, uh, can, can I help you? And the guy said, I, I don't know. My dad said, well, why are you here? I don't know. He said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, mister, you're not going to believe this story. He said, I've been sitting over here in a bar room on Tulane and Carrollton for the last two days. Now, in New Orleans, there are a lot of bar rooms that don't even have locks on their doors because they are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, okay? So he had been in that bar for a couple of days, drinking. And he said, this morning, he said, I was having another drink. And he said, all of a sudden, this voice spoke to me. You believe it? Uh, preacher, I'm telling you, a voice spoke to me and said, you got to go to that church. So he said, I put my drink down and I went out front and I hailed a cab. And I told the cab driver, take me to that church. And he said, which church? He said, come on, man. <laughs> Everybody knows where that church is. Come on. So he took me here and that's why I'm here. My dad said, well, would you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart? He said, sure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just sitting there watching him. Dad prayed salvation prayer with him. He was instantly sobered. Yeah. Instantly. <laughs> and all of a sudden, from behind him, my dad hears, my baby, my baby. That's my baby. And he turns around and the lady laying on the floor is shaking her rosary beads at my dad. She said, that's my baby. That's what we were praying for, Father Gorman. And God heard us. Now it's time to pray. Now, I, I'm not going to do this teaching tonight, but on, what's the first day I teach in the School of Champions? Tuesday, I'll be teaching School of Champions first day. First day, I'm teaching on anointings and contagious anointings. The second session will be on contagious anointings, how you catch anointings. But in that teaching, the first way that I teach you can catch an anointing is by inheritance. Paul told Timothy, I see in you the anointing I saw in you. I see in you the anointing that was in your grandfather. We were up here tonight during the worship service. And one of the guys, he and his wife came up here. And he walked over to say hi to Cheryl and whoa, right flat out on the floor. I said, Gina, did you see that? She just touched him and out he went. I said, she is among us, but she is not of us. By the way, I'm the one who gave her the name Warrior Queen. If y'all wanna know who gave her the name, in 1998, I gave her the name Warrior Queen. But anyway, she has that anointing. She and Juanita have the anointing they inherited from their grandfather. You said, that's not fair. It is what it is. You said, well, God's supposed to be fair. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Hey. Why? Because we have to take off our shoes in the airport. That's why. All right, but anyway, so. I shouldn't have said that. Can y'all edit that out? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was rude. If you wondered why Gina's here, she's here to just after the service go up to people and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> So 
so I inherited my dad's anointing. I inherited it. And I got it even a better way because the third way you catch an anointing is by serving the anointing you want to attract. And I served his anointing for so many years, financially and physically, served his anointing. And so I received it in double portion like Elisha did when he, when he ministered to and served Elijah's anointing. And so I want to say to you that tonight I want you to get a dose of the ghost. I want you to get some of that. Okay. But there are a lot of you who have never spoken in tongues before. Now, tomorrow morning, I'll be teaching the deets, okay, the details about the prayer language and intercessory prayer. And I'm going to be telling you stories that are just going, whoa, you know. So I'm looking forward to that. But tonight, we still are going to pray with anybody who wants to receive the prayer language tonight. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray for you tonight to receive. It's not going to be hard, but I do need, when you come forward, I'm going to need a few minutes to explain a couple of things to you before we pray. I always do that. I explain some things, not because they had somebody on the day of Pentecost saying, look, guys, before we start, you need to know this. But unfortunately, in our society, in the church world, we have preconceived ideas that we got to get rid of so we can get back to the way they were just full of hope and faith on the day of Pentecost without anything encumbering that. You get what I'm saying? So how many of you have never received the fullness of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and you want to receive? Just lift your hand. All right, all of you come forward right now. Come on. Now, here's, all right, turn me up just a little bit. In fact, let me use the handheld for this part, guys, if you don't mind. Let me use the handheld. Okay, all right. All right, don't, listen to me, listen to me closely. Don't stand behind anyone else, okay? Do not stand behind anyone else. We want to know who is up here to receive. Get close. Get up close, okay? There you go. All right? Anybody else? You've never spoken in tongues. You want to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's about to happen. Y'all better get up here under this spout. Come on. Now listen. Here's the next thing, okay? How many of you have, oh, this is a biggie, don't miss this. This is why I got the handheld, so I want you to hear me. I'll be like a rapper, turned upside down. All right, anyway, so. Any of you who have received in the past, but you have difficulty praying in tongues at will. When you're around people who are praying in the spirit, you can pray in the tongue, but you can't just at the drop of a hat, start speaking in tongues, and you need a refilling, a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, raise your hand if you want to get a refilling. Come on up, come on up, quickly, quickly, quickly. Get on up here. Now, while they're coming, here's the other thing I need. Pastor Dave, I do not know the, the name of the group to ask for, but people who are authorized in your church to pray with people in the altars as altar ministry, what is that group called? pastoral ministry team. I want all of them on this platform behind me very quickly. Come on up here, fast, fast, fast. Real quickly. Oh, the ones who are here to be refilled. Uh, oh, we've got room for everybody. Oh, good. Okay, I was gonna say you stand behind them. We have room for everybody. Come on up. Pastoral ministry team, everybody up here, quickly, quickly, quickly. Come on up, real fast. Hey, I love that song y'all sang tonight about we want you, we want you about the Holy Spirit. That was, I, I took a picture of the, of the screen. I was like that, I put it on Facebook. I'm like this is the perfect song for, for so, so I love that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Now, okay, yeah, you qualify too, Dave. You can come up here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow that. We'll allow that. So, can everybody, can everybody hear me good? All right. Let me just ask, um, let me see, uh, what's your name? That's correct. Okay, Crystal, come on up here. 
You got it right on the first try. Okay, now stand right here. Just face me. Face me. Okay, now. Can everybody see Crystal? Okay. Don't stand behind anybody else if you're coming for prayer. We're going to have people come stand behind you who are going to pray for you. Those who want to pray behind them for them to receive, come on up now. You can do that while I'm talking to Crystal. But do not touch them until I give you, give you direction. Just come on up, stand right behind them. Pray silently in the spirit, but please don't lay hands on anybody until I instruct you to do so. There's an important reason for that. The next few minutes, what I explain to you are going to make a big difference between people receiving and not receiving. Okay, it's important. So here we go. Crystal, yes. this is a dollar bill. This is your dollar. Okay. It's like 940. We need to get going. Let's do that. This is your dollar. Okay. There you go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. All right, put it in your pocket. Cargo pockets. Good. Cool. I love cargo pants. There you go. Put it in your pocket. Now go back down. Now you tonight you get Holy Spirit and a dollar. Now I want to explain to you why I had Crystal do that. Can everybody hear me? T turn me up just a hair, please, guys. So I want everybody to really hear this, okay? If, if Crystal tries any harder to receive Holy Spirit than she tried to receive that dollar, she's trying too hard because he is a gift. He's a gift. You don't have to beg. It. I've seen people, please, please, please fill me, please fill me, please fill me. Like God's going, ooh, ooh, jump a little higher, jump a little higher, jump a little higher. No, that's not how it is. God wants you to be filled. Does that make sense to you? Okay? Now, second thing is, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in a language. Look, Everybody look at me. Please do not be distracted looking at anybody else. If you want to receive, these next few minutes are going to make the difference whether you receive or whether you, whether you don't. If you really listen closely, this will really help you. So listen to this. When you receive, you're going to speak in a language you've never spoken in before. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel strange. I've been praying with people sometimes and they would stop right in the middle of speaking in tongues and say, doesn't sound right. I'm like, how many times have you spoken in tongues? Oh, it's my first time. Well, then what makes you an authority on what sounds right? Oh, well, it doesn't sound like my mama or it doesn't sound like my pastor or it doesn't sound like my, my dad. Or No, you're not up here to repeat after them, Okay. God's going to give you a heavenly. This is not the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12. I'll teach on that tomorrow. This is not the gift of tongues that needs to be interpreted. This is the prayer language. It does not have to be a language that's spoken in another nation on earth. This is a heavenly language that's just for you and God to communicate. Okay? That's all this is. Don't think it's got to be an articulate language of some nation. No, that was, I don't have time to teach on all the different type of languages, but just say, this is a prayer language. It's going to be a heavenly language and doesn't matter what it sounds like. What matters is that you say it, okay? Now, last thing I want to tell you before we pray is this, and this, I've had so many people tell me, they've said, the thing you tell about Peter walking on the water is what helped me to receive. Does everybody remember Peter walking on the water? I don't mean were you there. I just mean like, do you know the story? Do y'all remember? Okay. So the Bible says, when Peter came down out of the ship, he began to walk on the water. You say, well, that's duh. Yes. Well, but here's the point. He didn't get his miracle until he left security behind. For us, the boat is the English language. And you can walk in the boat all night long saying, Jesus said I could come. Jesus said I could come. I could walk on the water. Jesus said I could come. And you're still not walking on the water. You got to get out of the boat. So there's going to come a moment when I lead you in prayer that I'm going to say, get out of the boat. Now, I don't care how many languages you know how to speak. You can only say one word at a time. 
So if you're speaking in English, you're not speaking in tongues. Does that make sense? So when we start praying, don't, after I lead you in a prayer, don't pray in English. You were able to do that before you came up here. We're not up here to speak in English. You're up here to speak in tongues. So what you're gonna do is, you're going to get out of the boat. You say, well, when will I get my language? Now watch this, you're gonna get your language when your voice gets about right there. You say, why? Because before your voice gets right there, you don't need the language. You say, well, I want him to give it to me in advance. Two weeks in advance, double spaced, typewritten, so I can study. No, that would be like Peter saying, okay, Jesus, stop the wind, stop the waves, now freeze it over and I'll get out. Where's the miracle? The miracle is the wind was still blowing, the waves were still crashing, and he was able to get on top of it. So tonight we're gonna to pray and you're going to get out of the boat and you're going to speak and the Bible says, as they spake, the Spirit gave them utterance. He gave them the language, the words to speak. Okay, how old is she? Four, perfect age. My grandson received when he was seven, just, just last year he received when he was seven. Perfect age, that's awesome. The kids go through like that. They just go through so fast usually, so it's great. All right, so here we go. I want everybody, I want you to close your eyes. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to say this. I forgot to say this. The reason all these guys are up here is because I wanna wait till at least half of you are speaking in tongues before anyone behind you or in front of you lays hands on you or speaks to you. Why? Because I don't want the devil saying to you afterwards, you just were repeating what they said in your ear. I want it to be that you know that he filled you with nobody touching you just like it was on the day of Pentecost. After at least half of you are speaking in tongues, then I'll ask all you guys to go down, touch people, lay hands on them, and boom, when they laid hands on them, they began to receive, right? So that's what's gonna happen. So here we go. Everybody close your eyes, raise your hands up high. Sign of surrender God. Turn your head straight up to heaven. I've never in my life seen anybody receive the Holy Spirit with their head down. I never have. Turn your head straight up. Close your eyes so nothing distracts you. And repeat this prayer. Say, dear Father, I believe that you gave Holy Spirit to me as a gift. I ask you now, forgive me of anything in my life that displeases you. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. I ask you now, fill me with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I'm power hungry. I want the power that raised Jesus from the dead to flow through me. And in Jesus' name, I now receive and I will speak in a new language as you give it to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. Everybody get out of the boat and start speaking in tongues right now. Everybody put your hands forward, begin to pray in tongues right now. Everybody put your hands forward. Don't lay your hands on them yet. Very right, put your hands forward. Everyone just start speaking in tongues. There's so many speaking it. My goodness, look at them. Right there, right there. Right there, right there, right there. Come on down, Cheryl, get, go, 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 go. All right, everybody, there's enough of them speaking. Y'all going down. Let's all start laying hands on them. Let's go. Praise the Lord. Real quickly, let's lay hands on them. Get them filled. 